Hello, and thank you for joining us once again for a Bible study that we want to do in continuing a new series that we're doing during this interim that's entitled The Sayings of Jesus. I want to focus on one that's found in Matthew chapter 7, but I'm going to primarily look at the parallel one in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, verse 31. So if you have your notes, why don't you get set in Luke chapter 6 as we can go now into this study on one of the major sayings of Jesus Christ. Let me take you back in to a story that we often hear that's called the wooden bowl. It's a parable that's fabled, that's told about a family that was in Europe during the years gone by and that this family, they had a grandfather who lived by himself but because he was becoming older and needed some assistance and help, he was invited and agreed to come and live with his son his married son. So he comes to live with the, ma the son, his wife, and the husband and wife have a four-year-old child. The old man comes, things go well for a little bit, but time goes by and the old man starts showing more and more signs of aging, including shaky, uh, shakiness while he's eating. And as a result, he's spilling some of the food, the soups, the other uh, items on the tablecloth, and the wife is becoming more and more frustrated. He's becoming to the point where he's dropping some of his food on the floor. The son and his wife, they become a little bit perturbed with him during meal times. And then worst of all, he gets to the point where he drops some of the cups, he slips and the plates go to the floor, and they become absolutely beside themselves that he is destroying their beautiful table setting when the family gets together. So the husband and wife decide what they're going to do with the old father is they're going to put him into a place by himself off in the corner of the room. They set up a bench there and instead of giving him any good tableware, this time they give him a wooden bowl, a wooden cup. And they give him silverware that definitely he couldn't damage. And there he has to sit now, meal after meal, by himself and then as well being very careful not to spill. The four-year-old watches this. He watches how mom and dad are treating his grandfather and he takes into account what's happening and one day the dad walks out the door and he sees the little boy there in the yard and he's working with some wood. He's whittling it ever so little and he asks the son what he's doing. He says, I'm making you a wooden bowl. I'm preparing for the day when you and mommy get old and you're no longer allowed to sit at my table and ruin my pretty tablecloth. Well, mom and dad they don't have to say a word to each other. They know exactly what they've done. They've, in, they've instructed their boy in a way that they didn't want to. All of a sudden their boy is learning from them something that isn't gracious, isn't kind. And as a result, they, they change the whole scenario very quickly. Dad is once again invited to eat at the table. And for the rest of his life, he is treated kindly and graciously even if he spills, even if he breaks things. We read from that, we learn from that story that it is very important how we act because that may impact other people around us. Well, Jesus knew that. And so in his Sermon on the Mount, he is going to talk about how we conduct ourselves. And a lot of the sermon deals with interpersonal relationships and what kind of a testimony we have upon the world around us, what kind of influence and what kind of example we're setting. Now let's just remind ourselves about this sermon. This sermon is one that's given and Jesus makes it very clear that he and the other teachers that are there at the time, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they do not agree. They have different views of God. They have different views of how to get into heaven. Jesus makes it very clear to his audience that the only way that they can get into heaven is through faith in Christ and Christ alone. He talks about that idea that there's a broad way and a narrow way and you have to make this specific narrow choice to call upon Christ as Savior. He makes that clear when he talks about the very end that if you don't know him, even if you say, have not we done these wonderful works, I never knew you, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Jesus Christ then in this sermon, he deals with the, his followers becoming good examples, becoming the salt, becoming the light to the world. In fact, he makes it very clear that we who are his followers are to be different from the world. We're not to act the same way. In fact, we're supposed to be different in such a way that we would impact, we would catch their attention. Is that while we interact with people, not isolate from them, we will help them to see the Father in heaven as they observe our good works. 
And so Jesus deals with a lot of the spiritual issues, a lot of the practical issues, and he deals with some of the very practical ways that we relate one to another when he starts discussing things about almsgiving, when he talks about how we control our temper, when he talks about honesty with one another and, and oaths that we may make, how families relate when it comes to marriage and divorce, finances, deals with a lot of those practical areas that would encourage his believers to become standout testimonies for the God in heaven. One of the areas that he deals with is he's going to give a statement that is really pungent, that is loaded with truth. And that is a statement that he is going to say, you basically, you need to improve the way you treat other people. We know the singular statement as the golden rule. It is that passage that we already referred to, Luke 6, Matthew 7, verse 12 in Matthew, Luke 6, verse 31, as you would that men should do to you, do you also to them likewise. Now, when we're studying this for today's time, let's ask three major questions. Major questions about this statement that will help us to know how to live it out and to fulfill what Christ is commanding us in this verse. Let's ask this first question. The first question being, what should we notice about the statement? that Jesus is teaching to his disciples then and to us now. And I want to drive home several different important thoughts that, are, that will help you to take the full measure of this text into your life and make application. One, I want you to notice this, that what Jesus said at that time was very unusual. It was very, very unique, if we could say it that way, compared to what was being taught. Now, he was not the first one to have something similar like this being said. We can go back into many ancient writings and we will notice that there was something similar or parallel to what he was saying in a lot of different authors, a lot of different speakers, a lot of philosophers for several hundred years even. You'll notice the time frame as we give these illustrations, such as Socrates, he said, do not do to others that which angers you when they do it to you. We read about Epictetus who said, what you avoid suffering yourself, do not afflict on others. There's others that wrote, what you do not want to be done to you, do not do to anyone else. We start getting into some of the Jewish philosophers and writers, whatever things anyone hates to suffer, let him not do to others as well. What you wish no evil to befall you, operate by the same principle, don't let it fall on your subjects or others. And then even in one of those apocryphal books, Tobit, he says, what you yourself hate, do to no man. And then we have Hillel, who was one of the famous rabbis just before Christ's period, who was very influential on the Pharisees and the Sadducees of that day. He had written, what is hateful to yourself, do not do to someone else. Now, those were many of those ancient popular writers of those days. What Jesus said is similar, but it is different at the same time. If you think back to what we just shared with you, most of the statements made by those philosophers come from a negative point of view. Don't do something that you don't like having done to you. Jesus, on the other hand, he says it in a very positive fashion. Do to others what you like to be done to you. Let's see if we can make it really clear in application. He said, there, the other writers are saying, don't steal because you don't like being stolen from. Uh, don't attack. You don't like being attacked. Don't seek revenge on because you don't appreciate that. Great. Good. We understand that. And that is true. But you can do that without interacting with anybody whatsoever. You can do that by hibernating in your home, being a recluse from society. You can do that by, by coming and worshiping and never having fellowship with folk. Jesus raises the bar much higher. Jesus challenges us that not only should we not do something, but taking it a, a much higher, he says, you need to do that what you like to be done to you. Such as, okay, not only don't kill, don't steal, don't hurt somebody, don't gossip about them, but if you like being loved, then you need to love. If you're an individual who enjoys receiving things, then you need to make it a practice in your life that you are giving. If you like being appreciated, then you need to appreciate other individuals. If you're an individual who enjoys being forgiven for the mistakes that you make, then you need to be one who is extending forgiveness. You like people showing you politeness and manners, then you need to show the same to them. You like people to compliment you. 
to thank you for, for what you have done, then you need to do that to them. So we know that his teaching was unusual. His teaching was unending. What I mean by that is simply this. He uses an imperative, do unto others, as you would have them do to you. The imperative has the idea of just keep this to be your normal pattern of life. In other words, that this characteristic should be a, a bit, an habitual lifestyle that you operate under the premise that you will treat others the way you want to be treated by others. You will do for others the things that you appreciate being done for you. This is, your, this is your common practice. This is unending in your life. It's just not, okay, we have somebody visiting our house. Now I'm going to be on my best behavior. Okay, now we're at church. Now I'm going to you know, up our standard. No, this should be the way you act on a regular 24-7 basis in your relationship with other people. You're keeping in mind that I'm going to treat others the way I like to be treated. It's unusual. It's unending. Let me give you another thought. If we look at what he said, it is universal. Basically what Jesus is saying is putting an emphasis in this phrase when you look at it in the original language upon the whatever you like, then you are to do. The you becomes very emphatic and this you as well is a plural pronoun. It is all inclusive to everyone who is listening to his Sermon on the Mount at that time and to you and I who read it even in this day and age. And so the challenge is that you and I, we do this not just those of ancient days, not just those in clergy positions, not just those who are teaching Sunday school, but you. You who are of whatever age, whatever position in life, you should make this a practice as a follower of Jesus Christ that you do unto others as you would have others do unto you. It's universal. Let me add another thought. It's to be uninhibited. What I mean by that is this, is Jesus is commanding us to do much more than just thinking about what we might do for somebody else. Thinking about how much we appreciate a note, so we should send them a note, but never doing it. Jesus raises that bar that says, wait a minute, you're supposed to be taking this positive action. Do. You do what you like being done to you. And so Jesus is making it clear that you and I are to be proactive. Uh, what I mean again is that we're to be uninhibited. We are not to be waiting for others to do to us before we reciprocate. You and I are supposed to be taking the initiative, going out of our way of actually doing for others that what we would appreciate others doing for us. So we have all these different factors that we put together and we say, okay, now how might that look for me? Well, if you like it when others welcome you and make you feel important, when you walk into a room or a setting or a, a church or, or some family setting where you're visiting some neighbor when we have opportunities that we can engage people, well, you like it when you're welcomed and people engage you in conversation, then you do that. You take the initiative. You don't excuse it by saying, I'm a shy person. No, you do what Christ asks you to do so as to up the standard of being his follower and making an impact on the world around you. You like it when people volunteer to help you out. If you have something to be done, some project, some, some chore, or maybe you have to move and you say, boy, I really like it if people, if they would help and volunteer to help me when I have to move from one place to another place, then you have to ask your question, have you volunteered to help others? That's the idea of do unto others the way you would have them do to you. Let, let's see this. You like it when somebody takes your kids and gives you a break. Have you ever done that for others? Or do you only wait until somebody's made the offer and then now we make it a bargain, a barter deal, that all of a sudden I'll watch your kids only if first of all you watch mine. That's not what Christ calls us to do. He calls us to go the extra mile, to be proactive, uninhibited in our reaching out and ministering. So you like it when somebody picks up an, an item and they drop it off on the table and they say, I've been thinking about you as my prayer pal. You're supposed to take the initiative and not wait for others that you do this. You like it when people compliment you on the way you played your game at school or the way that the clothing that you're wearing, then you go out of your way and you compliment others. And you make that a part of your regular interaction with other individuals. You like it when others teach your kids and put, invest in them. Well, how about then you doing that in a situation of like a church setting? 
teaching other people's kids, volunteering to get involved in that area, or even taking some time and saying, offering, if you have some homeschool friends, that you would be able to do some instruction with them. I know that we're limited at this time, but we can still be practicing this golden rule, though we are supposed to be maintaining distances from people. You like it when others pray for you. Are you praying for them? You like it when we said last week that some people should take the directory and pray through a pray page and drop a note. You like it so much, some of you may have been sitting back and waiting to see what would happen in your mailbox. My question is, what did you do this week? Did you pray for them? Did you write notes? Did you take the initiative to do for others in something so instrumental in encouraging other, uh, other believers? You, you like it in the fact that others might call, but are you calling people during this time? You like it if some people offer to help you. Have you offered to help? And I know we're limited. But the factor, fact is, you and I are supposed to step up to a higher standard in calling that we don't just not harm people, not steal from people, not hurt people, but we go to a much higher calling where we minister to people, where we go out of our way to be an encouragement, a blessing, a help to other individuals. Jesus' teaching, let's add this, it was to be unlimited. What he is saying is that in this practice, I have an uh, not only an unending situation that this is your, your lifestyle, this is your regular practice, this is what you purpose to do every single day, at least once a day, but in an unlimited fashion, where he's talking in Matthew chapter 7, you look at it, it says that whatsoever things you like being done to you, unlimited, in the scope of what we might do. In, in fact, let's put it this way, there is no limited as to what we might do in that sense of words, activities, spiritual deeds of ministering to other individuals, no limit. No limit in the what we do. There is no limit where we do it. No limit as far as, okay, this is only to be done at church, this is only to be done at my workplace. No, this would be done at your home as well. You're to have this type of an attitude. And again, I'm going to encourage you, even on a daily basis, make it a purposeful act once a day that you do this at home or if you still are able to work at work or when you go out in public, do something that characterizes you in all places, in all forms of activity and interrelation, that you are treating others the way you like to be treated. The golden rule is to be unlimited in that the people's the numbers, the individuals that you treat this way. In this text, in Luke chapter 6, he just makes the comment, as you would that men in general should do to you, do also to them, plural, likewise. But then he goes on in the next few verses, and he starts showing some practical application of this. For if you love them which love you, what thank have you? For sinners also love that, that uh, those that love them. If you do good to them that do good to you, what thank you for sinners also? If you lend to them whom you hope to receive, he says, fine, great, but sinners also lend. If you love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing. Wait a minute, now he's just raised the bar. In those verses, he has challenged us that we should extend ourselves beyond our circle of friends beyond the people that we're comfortable with, the people that we know, that we should even extend ourselves to people that we, that we don't know well or who might even, we might put them in a category as an adversary, an enemy, somebody that we necessarily don't get along with. So we ask, ask ourselves this question, how do you treat those individuals that you don't know very well? How have you interacted with or towards those that you don't really like, or it's kind of clear they don't like you. Uh, let me see if I can make it more pointed. Do you speak of those who you haven't gotten along with? Do you speak of them the way you want to be spoken of? Um, do you reach out to them, those strangers, those individuals that, that you kind of rub, the, they rub you the wrong way or vice versa? Have you made effort to reach out and to show some forms of friendliness? And it may be limited. But have you extended yourself towards them the way you wish they would extend? Or do you walk away and say, they didn't even talk to me? But you didn't either. You made no effort as well. And Jesus is challenging. He says, you know, in, in the sense of treating others, if, if somebody that you don't necessarily get along with 
if that something happens, do you give them the benefit of the doubt the way you expect to be given the benefit of the doubt? So this becomes very, very hard to live up to. That's why the bar is way up here, and you and I need to strive to live by the golden rule on a regular daily basis. Jesus' comments were just absolutely impacted with truth. In other words, he has said, not only is it to be unlimited, unending, uninhibited, it's unusual, but let me add something that, that to me was extremely convicting and challenging. It's to be unequaled. What I mean by that is this, that Jesus in his comments that he makes in verses 32, 33, and 34, he makes it very clear that you and I are to go way beyond what is normally done by people around us in this world. Hey, let, me, let me see if it goes this way. In those specific applications, he wanted his, his disciples to avoid harming others, that's true, and to reach out to others beyond their circles, that's true, but his last statement each time, it makes it very clear, you and I are to go beyond what the sinners, the world in general around us, how they operate. We are to be far more um, active in practicing the golden rule than the world around us. The, the sinners can be gracious to those who are gracious to them. The, the sinners, as he says, they can do good to, to those who do good to them. Uh, the sinners, as he calls them, they can lend to those that, that they hope to receive. You and I are to do much better. We're to do much higher. We are supposed to be going much further than the world around us goes. We're to be unequaled in how we treat others in a gracious, kind, or dare we say what this text is all about, in a loving fashion. Our, our compassion, our efforts, our outgoing to minister is to be unequaled, unparalleled with what the world is doing. We are to be more charitable. We are to be more forgiving. We are to be more understanding. We are to be you know, involved with far less critical spirits, far less gossip. We are to be living much higher standard and level of love and interaction with one another and with others outside of our body than the world would and does. And so Jesus' comments basically say we are to excel compared to the lost world around us the way we treat other people. Do you? Do you excel when it comes to how you treat others? Do you, <clears throat> do you and your family, your extended family, are you known in the family clan as the one who is going to extend kindness far beyond the way the others extend kindness to one another, the cousins, the aunts, the uncles. Do you treat the rest of the clan at a more gracious level than others in the clan treat each other? Uh, do you, when it comes to school, church, different things, are you the teenager who others know you for sure are going to be one who's going to welcome? That's just the way you are. You are going to extend yourselves. You are going to be gracious to strangers. You are going to be very considerate of others. That you are going to try to be the one who is going to be the, the inviter, the, the one who makes them feel at home. Do, do you stand out that way? You say, but I'm shy. It doesn't make any difference. Jesus says, treat others the way you want to be treated. He, can we make this application? Are you the one at work, at your place of employment, that is known to be the helpful one. If somebody has a need, if somebody has, um, has some burden or some trial or trouble, that they know that they can count on you for words of encouragement, that you're going to be the one that, yeah, you'll pray for them. You'll be the one that will give them assistance. Are you known as outstanding in these areas compared to other people that you work with? or you go to school with? Are you an individual that others are, are absolutely certain that they don't want to come and talk to you about gossip because they know that you don't gossip? That you're an individual that, that you will tell them to stop because you don't like people gossiping about you. You will stop others from gossiping about others. And so they don't come to you because you're going to challenge them. Is that you? Is that your reputation? Are you, do you have a reputation that you keep confidences? That others can come and tell you things 
fully confident that it's not going to spread through the rest of the family, the rest of the body, the rest of the community near you, the neighborhood? Or are you the individual that even some of your closest friends and family members, they keep you in the dark because you just plain don't keep confidences? You are to live and I am to live in such a way that we have raised the bar high that means we are treating others the way that we want to be treated. Friendliness, assistance, keeping confidences, not talking behind the back. Those are, those are just a few of what Jesus said. But let's, let's kind of bring it together. He says it's to be unconditional. What I mean by that is this idea. He made it clear that even if they have treated us poor in the past, verse 35, love your enemies. Even if somebody has done us harm, we are still supposed to treat them the way we want to be treated. We're not supposed to be vengeful. We are supposed to go and, and help them, be of assistance, without expectation of gain or reward which he talks about here in this text, where he talks about how some individuals, the only way that they will assist and they will help is if they are guaranteed that they will get some benefit from it. The, the, the reason I bring that up is in this text. Let, let me just take one phrase where he says in verse 34, if you lend to them that you hope to receive, you know, what reward is there? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. There's a couple different possibilities here, and we remember that according to the Old Testament law, they were allowed to lend. They couldn't charge usury or interest, but they were allowed to lend between one another. But it got a little bit um, spicy at times, because remember then every so many years that all the loans were to be canceled. Well, some individuals, as we know from history, some individuals, as you got into that, that last year before loans could be, were all supposed to be canceled, some people no longer wanted to help, no longer wanted to provide assistance. They didn't, they, they didn't want to lose out on some of the repayment. And so there was, a, there was a hesitancy at times of being helpful and assisting and giving some breaks to those who were in need at that moment. Is that what Jesus is referring to? Is, is, is he talking to individuals within his audience who are now um, approaching a time period where they were saying, we're not going to loan, we're not going to lend, we're not going to help out people in need anymore because in the next year or two, loans are canceled and we won't get our full refund and, I, and, and we can't live without that money. Is that what he's talking about? Or is he, is he referring to the idea that you would only help out people, and this could be the case for some, they would only help out people if, they were, if that person they were helping out could sometime in the future help them out in return if they have a need. You know, I'll scratch your back, you scratch my back. In other words, that they were using their monies to secure their future. And if they couldn't make things secure for the future where they could get some gain or benefit, then they weren't interested in being charitable and helping out other individuals without the interest rate. So Jesus is talking basically to groups of people, excuse me, <coughs> individuals who he's challenging that even when it comes to your finances, that you're supposed to treat others the way you would want to be treated. If you had a need, somebody help you out. It, even if it meant that, that, you know, it could be challenging during that time period. Point is, the golden rule is re-summarized when we go into verse 35 where he reiterates if you love your enemies and do good and land hoping for nothing again and your reward shall be great. Jesus is saying you and I go beyond normal common expectations. Go beyond even what the others around you might be recommending. You live by a standard of love and compassion that compels you to go the extra mile to treat others in a way that you would want to be treated. So we have that explanation of some of what he said. Let's ask this one. Why should we do what Jesus wanted his disciples to do? Why? What would compel us to live up to this standard? Well, there are some reasons given right in this text. Number one reason is that which stands out that's very clear. It's required. <coughs> it's a command. In this verse, all of what he's teaching as he's, as he's um, giving the basic statement and then he gives the illustrations and application such as loving, saluting, lending, they're all in the idea of an imperative. This is all commands by God and Jesus Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. But he also makes the comment in the middle of verse 35, 
that he'll be rewarded. Your reward shall be great. And so he talks about this idea and makes allusion to it, just as he's done earlier in this very same setting, the idea of laying up treasures and, and making sure, sure that you seek that which is above. He's saying that God's people who follow God's explicit commands like this, they're going to be re rewarded in one way or another. That he says your reward will be great. Now, how does that look? Does that mean that even in this lifetime you may be rewarded? to a degree, well, maybe, maybe that's what he means. Maybe it fits with a study that was done by one of the United States universities not too long ago, that what they did is they uh, did a complete study, and in that study, they, they had the individuals, uh, and I don't have my notes right here, I'm sorry, but I'll just do it by memory. They, they had a group of individuals, it was a, a gentleman who did a study, his last name was Rams, he did a study as a child behavioralist, and he had several hundred people take this study. He had them write down a couple things. One was this, write down the names of ten people that you know very well. Maybe a family member, a few of them, and outside your family. And he had them write them down. Then he had them write down next to that, that name. Now write this down. Would you describe them in general as a happy person or a person that isn't real happy? And people wrote that down. Then he says, next to that I want you to write down this. In general, are they a person who are self-centered or they are others-centered? That they are going out of the way for others on a regular basis. And he found out that through this informal study, that the, the overwhelming percentage was that the people who were described as happy were also the very same people who were described as other-centered individuals, not self-centered. And his conclusion was that one of the benefits of trying to do for others is that it produces in our own life, in our own, in our own testimony, that we are people that have peace and joy and happiness. So there is benefits even if that reward may be in this life. But surely then there's the reward of well done thou good and faithful servant. And so God makes it very clear that he'll reward. Now I do know that again not every time when you treat others well will you get that reciprocated to you. We all know that. We all know that, that's, that some people you treat them, you, you give them the best and they are just going to play and take advantage of it. Uh, we even know that even from the part, so much part of life, it became part of one of the Peanuts comic uh, sections one time. There's a, there's a picture of Lucy and Charlie Brown and they're headed, to, or they're not headed, they're standing in line at a theater. And they're waiting to buy their tickets to go into the movie. And as they're standing there waiting to buy the tickets, there's uh, Charlie Brown, he's talking and he's sharing with Lucy and making all these comments that he shouldn't be here. He's got homework to do, he's got all kinds of things to do, but the only reason that he is here standing in this long line is because they are giving out candy bars to the first 150 people who buy tickets. And so while he's telling Lucy this, Lucy is not only listening to him, but she's also listening to the ticket guy as they approach the counter. And so she knows what the ticket person is saying, and she's listening to Charlie Brown, and so she asks Charlie Brown, says, is it okay if I step in front of you? And here's the quote that Charlie Brown says, oh, please do. Ladies first, that is always my motto. I don't think this is a very good movie. I just came because of the free candy for the first 150 kids. I really should be at home doing my reading, but you know how it is when they're giving something away free. And he continues to talk. Just then, Lucy buys the ticket. The man announces, you are the 150th person, turns to Charlie Brown and says, sorry, boy, you don't get a candy bar. And that happened time and time again in the, in the episodes written about Charlie Brown and Lucy that she would take advantage. Do you have a Lucy in your life? That, that every moment you try to be gracious and kind, that that individual may take advantage? So what do you do? Do you then hole up into your self-centeredness yourself and your anger and your bitterness? Or do you continue to live to a standard that Christ called us, and that standard, do good to others the way you would have them do good to you? We look, we look and we say, hey, listen, there's something else in this text that is so important that sometimes we forget. And not only is this required, not only is this rewarded, but if we act this way, we are reflecting God in our lives. 
We are showing God Almighty. That's what he talks about in this next couple of phrases. He says, your reward shall be great, in verse 35, you shall be the children of the highest. He's not saying you work your way into heaven. He is saying you will be identified as the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the thankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. Hey, listen, you and I know this. We know by multiple illustrations of celebrities and others that oftentimes children take on the physical characteristics of their parent. Well, that's what he is talking about in this passage. He is saying you should take on the loving characteristics of your father so that you are easily identified as one of the children of the highest. Is that true in your life? Are you an individual that people would look and say, there is an example of Christ-likeness in the compassion, the graciousness, the way that you treat others, the way you want to be treated? There's a story that I was reading about missionary, uh, in a missionary book, about some of the history of the church in North Africa. The account is given by a fellow that, that was writing in the 80s, well knew his history there in Egypt. His name was uh, Bishop, Bishop Samuel, I believe is, is the author. And uh, he had been killed in an attack that was done against the president of Egypt, Anwar Sadat, in the, in the 80s. And uh, yet from some of his books that he has written, we learn that, that he had recorded several things that happened in that region of the world that hadn't been popular knowledge but he had, uh, he had found accounts and things of that sort and recorded their history of, that, of the church in that region, in North Africa, especially in Egypt. And in that record that he had compiled, he told of how when Christianity first came into the region, it wasn't popular. But something happened that captured the minds and the hearts of those people in North Africa and drew them to Christianity. And he illustrated what it was. There were situations like this that many people in that region of the world that if they had a child born into their home and they were unwanted, they would leave the child on some of the, the roadways outside of town so that those children would succumb to the, to the elements or be taken by wild animals. And the believers that were starting to grow in number, they developed a practice that many of the nursing mothers would gather together of the believers there in the town square one day of the week, they would, or a couple times a week, then they would send out some of the young men from the body believers who would go on what they called baby runs. They would go to see if there were children that were left by the roadside, bring them to those nursing mothers who would then provide nourishment for the children, and then they would decide amongst themselves who was going to basically adopt the child. The Christian families grew in great number but they were noted for ha their children surviving much longer than the others. But it astounded many of the people of that region that these people would reach out to those that weren't wanted. And then there, a plague came through the region around that same time. Many people succumbed to the plague and died. The bodies were often left outside the city or outside the town as people were fearful that taking care of the bodies and giving them burial might cause them to be afflicted with the same plague. And Samuel wrote from historical records how it became well known that the believers, the Christians, were the ones that would go out and they would take care of the bodies and provide proper burial to those bodies that their own families Peoples within their own neighborhood wouldn't even dare take care of and providing for. But the believers became well known for doing these, these unexpected acts of kindness. And Samuel wrote in his book, his historical writing of that region, that after a short period of time, Christianity started to blossom and bloom because so many people were impacted by the graciousness of the believers in such unexpected ways. Well, he says to us, listen, we should act in unexpected fashion. We should do to others what we would have to us because then we are revealing the Father and then we are sharing the gospel. The, the author, Bishop Samuel, put down this pungent statement as he finished this, uh, this recounting of history. He said this, if we expect people to believe in our Redeemer, we are going to have to look more like we are redeemed by him. That includes loving the enemies. That includes reaching out and being gracious. That includes the lending. That includes the greetings. That includes the forgiving. 
And you and I are called to live to such a high standard so as to reflect our Father and make an impact as the salt and the light. Now how does that look? What might that look like in your life and my life? To be very simple, to be very practical, we've alluded to some of those ideas. But Matthew, even in the previous passage, uh, in Matthew, we're in previous verses to where he makes the golden rule, he talks about that idea of saluting others, greeting others, extending that way. In Luke, it talks about doing good to others. In uh, Luke 6, it talks about lending that we already mentioned. It talks about being merciful. In Romans, it would be in the application, the idea of not seeking revenge, not retaliating, not speaking against, but rather heap coals of fire, do good good towards those who have done you harm or have done you wrong. We, we would read in Matthew where he talks about forgiving those that, that uh, need forgiveness who have offended us because we are forgiven. I had one author speaking about this. In his sermon, he wrote this. Let me give you some illustrations of how this golden rule might be applied in dealing with the lost. If you were a lost man or woman with a life bound up in sin, how would you want to be told? No one likes to be told they are wrong, and especially we don't like to be told in an unkind, caring way. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, the apostle tells his good friend Timothy how this should be approached. He says, quote, And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. In other words, share the gospel. Don't back away from it. But when you share the gospel, do it in a way that's not bombastic or proud or arrogant. Relay the gospel with a spirit of humility, compassion, and concern. In correcting one another, even spiritual ones like you and I, do not like to be corrected. That's true. When, when uh, we don't like to be told that we have made a mistake or an error in judgment, but if we are going to be confronted, which at times we need, we would rather be done with a meek and patient spirit. Paul instructs the believers for such an eventuality in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, where he says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, etc., etc. The speaker author goes on, The person who would obey the golden rule must first get their minds entirely off of themselves and fix at all moments on the needs, cares, loves, joys, hopes, and dreams of other people. One author put it this way, it is a remarkably flexible ethical principle. All we have to do is use our imagination, put ourselves in the other person's shoes, and ask, how would I like to be treated in this situation? Unquote. Challenging. Challenging to live this way. One little boy did this and challenged his own mother. A little boy by the name of Chad. He was in kindergarten age and he was a rather shy, you know, unassuming little boy. In fact, the other kids would mock him at times. In his class, his little boy would come home from school at times in tears because the other kids would make fun of him or wouldn't let him play with them. He just became, you know, basically the runt of the class and many treated him poorly. This little boy, however, didn't seek to retaliate. In fact, when Valentine's came, Day came around and it was coming up now in a couple of weeks, he came home and announced that he, the teacher had said they could make Valentine's and bring him in on such a day and that he, telling his mom, he was going to make a personal Valentine for all 35 kids in his class. His mother tried to talk him out of it. She was sure that he would possibly do this for everybody, but he himself wouldn't have a single valentine. The little boy was insistent. So mom went to the store, bought the supplies, and over the next two weeks they worked on it together. But she was cry trying to ease him into the idea that the other kids, you know, you're sure you want to do all the kids? Who are your closest friends? Nope, nope, all 35 kids. Day came, he was so excited, packed them all up into his book bag, went off to school. When he came home from school, mom expected him to be absolutely devastated, so she had made his favorite cookies as a snack. He got off the bus and came up the driveway. She's watching him. Sure enough, he's lagging way behind the other kids. His head's down. He's following. 
and he's just, he doesn't have this giddy up in his, in his steps. She was certain it had been a horrible day. He came walking in the door, and she called out. She said to Chad, I have your favorite cookies made if you want to come in. And before she could say another word, he burst into the kitchen, and he said, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. She said, what? Where's all the Valentines? He said, oh, I didn't get a single Valentine, but I didn't miss or forget one person in my class. I can't believe I remembered every single one. Are you that type of person? Are you the type of person that would rejoice in doing for others even if it doesn't come back to you? Are you the type of person that will go out of your way or will you limit it? Will you limit your grace, your kindness, your generosity to only those that will benefit you? or who have done for you. You and I are to rise above such a level of life, living. We're to be individuals that practice the golden rule that says, even in this circumstance, we do unto others as we would have others do to us. We show Christ no matter what, no matter when, no matter to whom. I pray that you will live up to the golden rule. Father, help us, help me, Help my friends to be individuals that personify this teaching of Jesus Christ in how we talk to one another, in how we, how we connect with one another, in how we treat one another, in how we pray for one another. Father, help us to be individuals of compassion, care, and extreme consideration the way you were. Thank you for the example and the challenge. Help us to live up to it this week. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thanks for joining us. God bless you for the remainder of this week. We'll be praying for you. Take care.